Good evening. Welcome to this edition of Northeast Diary. Here we bring you the latest developments from India's unexplored northeast region. Friends, the climate in some parts of northeast is excellent for tea cultivation. Today we will talk about the bustling tea industry of Tripura. We will also talk about how psychologists are at work in Mizoram to help people recover from mental challenges arising out of COVID pandemic. Tea is the second largest industry next to the rubber industry in Tripura and it is also the lone century old surviving industry in the state. In fact, Tripura is categorized as a traditional tea growing state with about 54 tea estates, 21 tea processing factories and more than 2500 small tea growers. The state stands as the fifth largest state among 16 tea producing states in India. The Tripura state government has also been constantly working for the development of the industry. With the concept to promote both tea and tourism together, this time the state government has decided to establish a tea museum which will highlight the achievements of the state's centuries-old industry. While speaking to AIR Not Is Daddy about the project, the chairman of Tripura Tea Development Corporation, TTDC, Santu Saha, said that both Tripura Tea Development Corporation and the Tourism Department have jointly started working for the purpose. He said the proposed tea museum has been projected to establish at the Durgavari Central Tea Processing Factory site, which is one of the largest tea states in the Northeast. Mr. Saha said. The project will be around 3.5 zero crore uh, for which the proposal is already sent to the Northeast Council. The funding will be done from there and also the state government will be doing some necessary steps so that the project can be completed at the earliest. Also in another development, Tourism Department has proposed for a piece of land in our Kamla Sagar tea state so that people traveling to Tripura who like to spend their time between the nature, they can spend their time in the log huts there. So accordingly, we are planning to start this project at the earliest. As soon as we receive fund, the project will start. So both this tea museum, which will be one of its first kind in the northeastern state, Tripura, where we will show the decades-old tea industry which was started by the then Maharajas of Tripura. And also to inform the people that Durgavari tea state is one of the oldest tea states in northeast. So I hope people who love to know more about tea and are tea lovers they will take some time out from their life to travel to Tripura, stay here in Tripura. They also visit other places in Tripura which are quite famous and see this tea museum where we will showcase the history of Tripura tea. It is also hoped that with this project, Tripura will emerge as a hotspot of international trade and commerce through all sorts of transportation mediums and also people from other parts of the country will get to know about the oldest industry of Tripura. For Nordis Diary, this is Rina Numaikham from Magatala. Nagaland state level Beti Bachao Beti Parao launched Jano Khelo Jito, Lan, Play, Win, a board game created to build awareness and knowledge on child sexual abuse, child labor, child rights, human trafficking and migration. We have a report on this. Created and designed by Arz Anyai Rahit Zindagi, Janu Kelo Jito board game has been successfully launched by Commissioner and Secretary, Social Welfare Department, Sara R. Witsi on 31st of July 2021. Arz, an NGO based in Goa, works on the issue of sexual violence. State Resource Center for Women under Social Welfare Department has been associated with Arz in conducting training and awareness on human trafficking in for the past years. More on this from Juliana Madon, State Nodal Officer, Peti Pachao, Peti Pachao. The Nagaland edition of Jano Kelo Jito, a special board game created by the NGO Ars from Goa, was launched by the state-level BBBP to introduce play and learn method of imparting awareness on issues such as sexual abuse, child labor, trafficking and migration. Nowadays, we are seeking more and more ways to make learning fun for people. And why not so with social issues? 
Through play and games, we realize that learning on issues can sensitize more people. We hope to reach more target groups through these games. We hope that schools and village communities will benefit from this game. To make the game more interesting, Jano Kelo Juto includes information relating to general knowledge about India. The board game has been introduced in different parts of India as well and has been successfully reaching out to different target groups. A virtual training of the game with Earth, Goa will be conducted for functionaries dealing with sexual abuse under the department. For Notice Diary, this is Asunyo from AIR News, Kojima. Sikkim, home to the world's third highest mountain, Mount Kanchand Zonga, has been promoting adventure sports particularly through the Indian Himalayan Centre for Adventure and Ecotourism at Chamche, South Sikkim, where Sikkim's Manita Pradhan, who is a trainer at the Institute, recently climbed the world's highest peak, Mount Everest. Let us hear her story. Mountaineer Manita Pradhan, who hails from Soaring in West Sikkim, climbed Mount Everest in June 2021. The feat marked a milestone in 38-year-old Manita's mountaineering journey that began in the year 2000 when she completed a basic course in mountaineering. Manita continued chasing her dream of conquering the Everest as a trainer at the Indian Himalayan Centre for Adventure and Ecotourism in South Sikkim and as a freelance guide after completing the method of instruction. Being selected among 12 mountaineers for the Indian Everest massive expedition organized by Indian Mountaineering Foundation. The expedition aimed to cover four peaks from one base, Mount Everest, Mount Lotse, Mount Nupse and Mount Pumori. Manita was selected to summit Mount Everest. She shares her journey. My journey started in the year 2000. से जब मैं क्लास नाइन में थी और एनएसएस के थ्रू किया था तब मुझे इतना आइडिया नहीं था माउंटेनरिंग के बारे में तो मैंने अपना एजुकेशन कंप्लीट करने में ही बेहतर समझा और मैंने एजुकेशन कंप्लीट किया उसके बाद 2007 में मैंने एडवांस कोर्स कंप्लीट किया एट में मैंने मेथड ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शन कम्प्लीट किया और उसके बाद थर्टीन में मैंने माउंट मनिरंग किया जिसका हाइट है सिक्स मीटर जो लाहौल स्पिति हिमाचल में है और थर्टीन में वो करने के बाद 14 में मैंने तेंजिंग खान किया जो सिक्किम में ही है और 15 में मैंने भागीरथी थ्री किया जो गंगोत्री रेंज में है और 2015 से लेकर 2019 तक स्किल डेवलपमेंट में काम किया और 19 में कंपटीशन हम लोग नाम लिस्ट आउट होने के बाद अंडर थर्टी पीपल सेलेक्ट हुए थे इंडियन एवरेस्ट मैसिव एक्सपीडिशन जो भी कॉम्पिटिटिव आए थे वो टफेस्ट से टफेस्ट कॉम्पिटिटिव थे उसी के बाद हम लोग बारह सिलेक्ट हुए थे ट्वेल्व मेंबर्स जो दो एवरेस्ट के लिए था दो लोत्से के लिए था चार नुस्से के लिए था और चार पॉमोडी के लिए थे अपना जितना भी एडवेंचर फील्ड में अपकमिंग क्लाइंबर्स है उन लोग को यही बोलना चाहूंगी की आप लोग मेंटली स्ट्रॉन्ग और फिजिकली फिट होके जाइए जैसे की यहाँ पर डिफरेंट लेवल होता है मेंटली और फिजिकली उसका बॉडी का स्ट्रक्चर ऊपर दूसरा सिचुएशन होता है Manita restarted her mountaineering journey in 2019 after quitting in 2015. She was selected among 130 candidates from around 2000 applicants and later among 65, 60 and 12 mountaineers to summit and represent India. After conquering the world's highest peak, Manita believes that there is no second chance in adventure and urges up and coming climbers to be physically and mentally prepared at all levels. With Tekka Saga, this is Paijat Sharma for Northeast Diary from AIR News, Sikkim. It is now well understood that COVID-19 pandemic has miserably affected lives all over the world directly as well as passively. Above all, the pandemic has also brought in a byproduct that is psychological impact and trauma. To address this issue, many state governments have started providing psychological counseling to the people in need. Let us see a report on this from an ISOL correspondent. To address the problem of psychological impact among the people, Mizoram Health Minister Dr. Lal Thangliana formed a committee on psychological and social guidance last year. Talking to AIR News, General Secretary of the Committee on Psychological and Social Guidance, Dr. Zothan Zami, gave details of the programs and activities run by a group of psychologists and sociologists in the state to address the COVID-born anxiety, stigma, and trauma. 
our committee started organizing talk shows in DDK and local TV channels on various psychological and issues related to COVID-19 in order to educate a larger section of the population. The psychological counseling cell was formed under the coordination of me and Dr. Rinwati. Clinical psychologists and psychologists volunteered under this committee. They were in charge of all quarantine centers, providing psychological counseling to those in need and also act as mediators between the government employees and the quarantines who are mostly students children, migrant workers. With the onset of the second wave this year, committee started re-educating the people on the state of the virus and its mutated nature, the need for vaccination, the importance of further precautionary measures and life in the new normal. The psychological counseling cell has also taken further initiative with placements of psychologists in different COVID care centers and hospitals. Online counseling has been made available to all inmates in these centers, as well as those living in containment zones. We have also started making small video clips regarding issues in COVID-19, and we have also started having our TV shows on various TV channels and also talk shows in various FM channels and radio. Dr. Zothanzami said that living with the pandemic along with lockdown and containment caused a sort of psychological disbalance in many people and they have recovered with a psychologist providing them counseling, exercise and tips so as to counter the mental effects. For Northeast Diary, this is Irene from Izol. In the times of climate change and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, news of distressed farmers keeps coming. However, in these tough times, the story of an organic sweet corn farmer, Kinshu Dapsu Karkhang of Rebhoi district, residing in Umeth village, can surely offer a change of pace. More on this from a Shillong correspondent. Sweet corns of Kinshu is quite famous among the locals of Umeth village in Rebhoi district of Meghalaya and other parts of the region and the state. The farmer started cultivating sweet corn since 2013 after he got an idea while traveling to Maharashtra that the price of organic corn can fetch good returns. Recognizing the efforts of this progressive farmer, the government of India awarded him for inspiring other farmers to practice organic method of farming in 2019. The humble farmer also uses social media platforms to connect to his customer. He said that due to the COVID-19 pandemic-induced lockdown across the state, this year business was not as good but somehow managed to sell the harvest with the support of the Department of Agriculture. Kin Xiu says that after receiving hand holdings from the Directorate of Horticulture, he learned the skills to convert agricultural waste to biocompost and use it to grow corns. His family assists in processing the produce and also helps in selling it in the market. Actually here we are growing only organic. We are not using this chemical fertilizer. Our ancestors we use this organic compost. After come to me that I'm searching how to make this organic compost or organic or bio NPK to make it good protection, especially for this maize and uh, So that's why I'm searching anywhere. So I get contact with the trade of um, agriculture, government of Meghalaya, and they are teaching how to make uh, this bio compost. Then I make this bio compost with the assistant or with the help of from the scientists and the officer from the government of Meghalaya, Department of Agriculture. While I'm doing this uh, organic production, I found that there's the taste of this sweet corn also is different than those I'm growing in organic. Known for his organic sweet corns which he produces in his field, Kin Xiu is some sort of a local celebrity with people recognizing the farmer wherever he goes. This is Rustam for Nordis Diary from AIR News Shillong. <laughs> Arunachal Pradesh government has launched the Air Gun Surrender Abhiyan in the state to minimize hunting and is getting huge support from the people, a report from a Itanagar correspondent. Hunting has been a traditional community practice among the more than 100 different tribes in Arunachal Pradesh. This practice of hunting started threatening the environment ever since air guns became available in the open market, chiefly Arunachal Pradesh government in a hope to conserve the different birds and other such species in its biodiversity-rich jungles has launched an initiative called Air Gun Surrender Abhiyan, wherein people are asked to surrender their air guns to the government. The initiative which was launched in the month of April this year 
has seen over a thousand air guns surrendered to the authority and is counting. East Siang district alone has accounted for over 500 air guns surrendered till now. Divisional Forest Officer of Pasighat, Mr. Tasi Mije, has informed that more than 520 persons have deposited their air guns with Territorial Forest Officers in East Siang District. रेंज में अब तो मैं 100 एवो क्वाइट में पार्क कर चुका हूं डिस्ट्रिक्ट का लेके अराउंड मोर देन 500 पार्क कर चुका हूं अभी भी दे रहा है मेरा हिसाब में हम लोग ज्यादा से ज्यादा अभी कोशिश करेंगे कि क्या 500 क्या 1000 तक हम लोग क्रॉस करने के लिए कोशिश कर रहा हूं पब्लिक बहुत अच्छा है इन लोग अभी महसूस कर चुका है कि इकोलॉजिकल इंबैलेंस के वजह से कितना हम लोग का यहां में वातावरण में चेंजेस आ गया पहले क्या था और आज क्या था पहले जानवर कैसा था पहले सीरिया कैसा था कितना सीरिया रहता था उसका तो पूरा रियलाइज हो गया एंड दे आर सो सपोर्टिंग मी स्पेशली जब जब हम गांव-गांव में हम लोग अवेयरनेस प्रोग्राम करते हैं तो इन लोग पूरा दिल से खुशी से हम लोग का साथ देता है Villagers who have surrendered their air guns with the forest department offices are of the opinion that they are aware of the natural ecosystem which is under threat due to rampant hunting of wild birds and animals. For North East Diary with Prafulla Kaman from East Young District, this is Rakesh Dole, Air News, Itanagar. In a personality of this week's section, today we bring to you an interview with Dr. John State Nodal Officer Ayush, Government of Nagaland, on yoga and its benefits. The interview is by Kohima correspondent Asunio. Over the last few decades, there has been an upsurge in the prevalence of yoga. People are realizing the importance of yoga as it is the key to cure modern day stress. However, before we get into the benefits of yoga, it is essential to understand what exactly yoga really is. And to know more today, we have an expert with us in the studio. He is Dr. Sayakritya John. State Program Officer and Nodal Officer, National Ayush Mission, Government of Nagaland. And I'm your host, Asonyo. Hello, Dr. John. It is a pleasure to have you in our program. Thank you for welcoming me. Well, to begin with, Dr. John, can you explain what yoga is and what are the different stages of yoga? The word yoga is derived from a Sanskrit root, yoj, meaning to bind or join or merge or union. It is a union of our will with the will of God. That is the actual meaning of yoga. Now, stages of yoga, according to Patanjali, the father of yoga, there are eight stages and that is called Astanga Yoga. The eight stages are Yama, that is the social discipline. Niyama, that is individual discipline. The third is Asana. Asana is uh, that of uh, doing that posture. The fourth one is Pranayama, that is breath control. The fifth one is Pratyahara, that is discipline of our senses. Dharana, that is the concentration, dhyana, meditation, and the last samadhi is self-realization. These are the eight stages of yoga. So in order to perform that asana, where most of us think that uh, those postures are yoga, but we have to follow these eight stages to get the real benefit of yoga. There are misconceptions about yoga also. So I just want to ask you, is yoga belong to any form of religion? No, yoga does not belong to any particular religion. Yoga is for all religion and for all people, for all race. Because of the benefit of yoga, especially in the spiritual growth, some of the religion put yoga into their religion and they used to practice. And it is also better faith formation. Because of that, they practice yoga, especially the meditation into their religion and they practice like our Hindu brothers, they do it. What are the benefits of yoga? One of the most important benefits is that it brings peace of mind. We can have peace within. Whoever practices yoga, they will have peace within. And we can control over our mind and our body. Actually, yoga is all around personality development. It helps in the management of stress, anxiety, and most of the psychosomatic diseases. By practicing yoga, it will improve your concentration, memory power. And also by performing these uh, asanas, there will be increase in the flexibility and the tones of your body. And it gives massaging effect to all the internal organs. So there are lots of benefits of yoga. So for a person to perform yoga, what is the best time? And is there any specific hours or duration to perform any asanas? Yeah, to perform yoga... Especially yoga asanas, 
early morning is the best or ideal time. And before starting yoga, we should make sure that our bowels and bladder should be empty. It should be in a well-ventilated room where it is calm and quiet. That is the place where we should perform. And usually we can perform even in the daytime or in even in the evening. But uh, we should see that... Uh, we should not do this asanas immediately after food. After two hours only, you can do this kind of uh, asanas. So is there any age bar to practice yoga? Actually, there is no age bar. Okay. It can be practiced by young and old alike. So for a people having chronic health issues, is it advisable for them to perform yoga? If there is, can you kindly share on this? So like uh, people with chronic problems, like uh, tuberculosis or stomach uh, ulcer or fractured bones. These people are not advised to go for practice of yogasana, but there are indications and contraindications. So whoever are about to practice, it is advisable for them to consult a yoga teacher or yoga therapist or a doctor before they practice. Otherwise, yoga is good for most of their health problems. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between yoga and exercise? Yes, there are lots of differences between yoga and exercises. People think that uh, yoga is a part of exercise, but actually there are a lot of differences. Like say, to perform yoga, there is a minimum expenditure of energy, whereas in exercises, it consumes lots of energies. Yoga does not lead to fatigue. Whereas in exercise, it leads to fatigue. In yoga, after the practice, there is a feeling of freshness. Whereas in exercises, you feel tired and you won't feel that much fresh. When you perform yoga, it requires only a small space. Whereas in exercises, you need larger space. Yoga can be performed by young and old, whereas exercises is mainly for the youth. Yoga, it has greater impact on the mind and the senses than other physical exercises. So, what is the contribution of yoga to a modern science? The modern medical system has replaced almost all the traditional system of medicine in different parts of this globe. It has proved itself most effective in saving men from contagious and infectious diseases. However, a new widespread psychosomatic ailments are posing a great challenge to this modern medical system. It is here that yoga plays an important role and it contributes to this uh, modern medical system. June 21 is celebrated as International Yoga Day. Can you share what it is all about? United Nations General Assembly on the 11th December 2014 declared 21st June as International Day of Yoga. It was our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi who initiated this move in the United Nations to declare 21st June as International Day of Yoga. More than 177 countries supported to declare 21st June as International Day of Yoga. India being very rich and this yoga is one of the invaluable gift to our Indian to the world. Because of that, our Prime Minister, he wants to popularize yoga to the world. Because of that, that we started celebrating this International uh, Yoga Day. Can you highlight briefly about your department? What are the activities carried out in our state to propagate the importance of yoga? National Ayush Mission was under Ayush Department. But in the year 2014, a new ministry was set up by the government of India. And under the ministry of Ayush, they have set up a mission called National Ayush Mission. National Ayush Mission here, they have given a direction to the state government to form the society. So as per the directive from the ministry, we have formed two society that is governing body as well as executive body. The main components of this mission is to promote Ayush services. Second is to promote the Ayush educational institution. The third is to facilitate the enforcement of quality control of Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani and homeopathic drugs. The fourth is cultivation of medicinal plants. So our mission, we are working on this, especially the basic components and we are covering the whole state of Nagaland. That is, uh, we are having a separate society. And under that society, that is Nagaland State Ayush Mission Society. Under this society in our state, we are trying to propagate the Ayush, especially Ayush Mission and also particularly yoga in our state. Mm -hmm. We have a few yoga wellness centers in our state where the students 
and the NCC are being asked to come to these uh, wellness centers to practice yoga. At the same time, we organize health games in all the districts of our state. Wherever we go for health games, we always have a yoga demonstrator with us so that yoga instructor will demonstrate yoga to the students. And in that way, we try to popularize yoga in our state and this will continue in the days to come. Okay, lastly, your message to our listeners. As I have said uh, before also that uh, yoga does not belong to any particular religion. Our people should not be misguided and the politician also should not politicize this yoga also. Here, yoga is something that you cannot get benefit just by reading books or watching TV programs on yoga. We can only get the real benefit of yoga only by practicing it. Until unless you practice, you cannot get the fruit of yoga. Therefore, I request all our listeners to practice yoga and have a healthy body and a healthy mind. Thank you, Dr. John, for enlightening us about yoga and its various health benefits. Well, listeners, let me end up by saying that yoga is inexpensive, free-handed form of exercise with a combination of breathing exercises and poses. Yoga as a practice has innumerable benefits that positively affects an individual both physically and mentally. Yoga is not a religion. It is a way of living that aims towards a healthy mind in a healthy body. And now, let us endeavor to know more about the special places that are nestled in the cozy corners of India's northeast. Today, we will talk about Agartala, the heritage city of Tripura. If it is not in your travel itinerary yet, you must definitely include it and visit this place and seep in the culture and architecture that the city has to offer. A correspondent tells us more about Agartala. Agartala is known for its strategic locations close to Bangladesh as well as its historical heritage. In 1838, Maharaja Krishna Kishore Manikya shifted the capital of the princely Tripura to Agartala from Udaipur. The Grand Royal Palace of the Manikya dynasty is a piece of major architectural grandeur. It is now more attractive as part of it has been converted into a museum. Earlier, this portion of the palace was used to house the assembly of Tripura. Maharani Manmohini Devi of Tripura had built a monastery on Math, which is located at Math Chaumuhani area of Agartala. This Math is another premier example of the architectural beauty of the royal regime. The mat was built on the cremation site of Maharani's father and Maharaja Bir Chandra Manikya's father-in-law. Besides, there are other sites like the red building which is still present on the side of the Agartala town hall. This red building during the royal period was known as Ujirbari. This house was the residence of the Prime Minister of the Royal Court. The building was demolished with time but its remains still exist to tell people the heritage of the royal regime. Apart from that, Bir Chandra Public Library built by Maharaja Bir Chandra Manikya still attracts the notice of many people travelling to Tripura. The Maharajas of Tripura had built the library to create a space for the then scholars and intelligentsia. The royal crematorium is located in the Batala area. Since the time of Maharaja Krishna Kishore Manikya, all the Maharajas of Tripura were cremated in the place. Even today, if anyone dies from the royal family, they are brought to the royal crematorium ground to perform the last rites. Separate monuments and memorials for Maharajas were constructed in the burial sites. MBB College, the oldest higher education institute of Tripura, is also another heritage site. Maharaja Bir Bikram started the college in 1947. Malancha Nibas is another building where the present government is planning to open a Rabindranath Tagore museum. The legendary poet had a close relationship with the Tripura Maharajas. Tagore stayed near Malancha Nivas while visiting Tripura. Jagannath Bari or the house of the Jagannath is a very famous temple near the palace compound. The city with a proper road planning has got such other historical sites as the Kaman Chaumahani, religious places like Chodda Debota Mandir or Temple of 14 Gods. The picturesque campus of Tripura University draws students from different nooks and corners of the country. Moreover, the city of Agartala is the gateway of historical treasure trove of Tripura. With the report of Veena Nongmaitam and Sashwati Bhattar.
With that, we have come to the end of this edition of Northeast Diary. Do join us next week to hear more stories from this enchanting part of India. Bye-bye.